Hi, welcome back to our show, Meaning and Motivation, where we'll explore the many ways that we make meaning together and why do we do what we do, our motivations. And with me today is Dr. James Drain, who is professor of bioethics at Edinburgh University. And Jim, we were right in the middle of a conversation the last time, and we just had to carry that conversation on because it was so good. All right. And thanks again for here staying I, with us I, and staying here hungry. Here I go. <laughs> and, uh, we were talking about the contraception issue and how people are caught between uh, the need, for instance, to uh, protect from disease or overpopulation or other things, but also the need to follow the rules uh, of the hierarchy and what people are saying. Mm -hmm. And so you're caught within these uh, belief systems. and. Yes. Why is it so tough for us to yeah. compromise our beliefs? Yes, or? that's a very good question. I mean, it not, only, it not only is one raised by that particular issue between the bishops and the laity or between the bishops and the, and the, uh, and the theologians, uh, but also it has to do with the relationship and the issues between the different religious denominations. Why can't they come to some agreement? We, we're going to celebrate 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation soon. Why can't we look at the issues that have been repeated over and over again in 500 years and not come to some kind of an agreement about it? We did actually come to some agreement. The, the present pope, when he was not a pope, organized a, 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 a meeting of Lutheran, Protestant, and Catholic scholars to try to come to agreement about the issues of the Reformation. They came to agreement. They solved the problems of the dogma and doctrine about the Reformation in the Catholic perspective and the Protestant perspective. But they couldn't get the, they couldn't get the people together, couldn't mm -hmm. get the churches together, couldn't get the individual places together. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult to get people to compromise, to open, to, to see another perspective and, 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 and to be ready to make some adjustment in, of their own. That's very difficult, especially in the area of religion. Now, why is that? Why can't we ever get over differences? Why can't we ever get over controversies in religion? Why can't we ever get over divisions in religion? Why are we still separated through all of the Eastern uh, nations, the, the, the uh, Greeks and the Armenians and all of the Eastern churches continue to be separated and, the, and then the Roman church and the Western church and the Eastern church and the Roman church and the, and the Protestant churches, the thousands of different Protestant churches mm -hmm. now, thousands. Now, what, all, what is that motivation? Why, why is that so difficult? Well, uh, you would g probably get uh, a lot of different ways of explaining that. Uh, I, I have a personal perspective, and I'll share it with you and with the viewers, uh, but it's only a personal perspective. Mm -hmm. It's only one person's way of seeing it. I say, why is... Why are our beliefs so rooted and so intransigent? And uh, I, I think that it has to do with evolution. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the whole history of the human being, of homo sapiens, of, of the human person, whether it's 100,000 years or 200,000 years, for most of that history, until recently modern times, the, there were only small groups of human beings mm -hmm. together, it's very small groups. You didn't have nations and big civilizations. You had very small groups of hunters and gatherers. Mm -hmm. that, that was what you and had. That's for, that's for millions of years. Not millions, but hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of years mm -hmm. now. Those small groups of hunters and gatherers also had religious convictions because the human person, by 
the structure of the human mind inevitably questions the surrounding, the origins of things, himself or herself, why are we here? Human beings confront reality in such a way as the reality raises questions that you have to try to struggle with. That's how we are different from other animals. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's the case, those small units that were around for those hundreds of thousands of years all had their own convictions about where we came from, how we came to be, how we should be, who did this to us, who's responsible for all these things that we see. They had religious type convictions, beliefs, mm -hmm. and they were deeply ingrained. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have contact and community with, uh, with, other, with, with a lot of other people to discuss these kind of things. So it seems to me that maybe the reason why we have so many difficulties today trying to come to some mediations comes from the fact that genetically we're, we're, we seem genetically programmed to keep to our convictions like the early hunters and gatherers did. Mm -hmm. Their convictions, that was the only thing that mattered. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing that counted. We seem to carry that over into the contemporary human situation mm -hmm. after after the the uh, the beginning of, of uh, agriculture and after the the, the proliferation of of more people and gre greater units of people and bigger bigger units of people and cultures and mm. all of that period you know which goes back maybe 10,000 years uh, but that that type of of of, uh, of change it seems to me we're trying to manage with the mindset that came from that earlier so still evolution. holding on to those uh, now this is a systems. personal mm -hmm. perspective but what is it that makes us seem to need to look at other groups, other religions, other people and say, they're wrong, we're right. Well, just think of what I just said though, Tim. All of those small units, mm -hmm. all of those small units had that very mentality. Mm -hmm. They had to and they keep, really they had, had to they, they had to make their own unit and they had to keep themselves from the others mm -hmm. and protect themselves from the others and consider themselves superior to the others. Now, this is a, I keep saying, don't get too serious about it because it's only one old guy at Edinburgh giving a, uh, a, a perspective that he's. But I think in a way, many people are trying to get at these same issues, I think right? The, I, mean, I think the issue, the reason why I try to respond to your question is because I think a lot of people have the question. I think you, you brought up a question that really, uh, occupies a lot of people's concerns. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same as people, for instance, watch the uh, U.S. government or the Congress in action yeah. and think about why well, that's can't another, they seem to get things done? Why is there this that's stalemate another example, between people? Tim, that's another example. Look at the Tea Party. I mean, you know, for them, compromise or, or looking at this from a broader perspective is heretical, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. You, you fight them and you, you, know, you go right down to the wire on it. And even if you wind up destroying the community, mm -hmm. you have to have some explanation of that. Mm -hmm. Why are people so disposed to retain their convictions over and against the need for recognizing broader perspectives or possibilities? And would that be a moral concern? I mean, is that at the heart of morality? That the is at the heart. It's the heart of a lot of the issues of morality. Though the issue that we d talked about about birth control is a good example of that. You have different religions uh, having different perspectives and and converting the perspective into the only way. You know, instead of trying to see the other perspective and trying to come to some m mediation and and appreciation of other perspectives. I think that, that that evolutionary view that I just explained, and don't give it too much seriousness because it's not anything, you know, that, uh, that you find, uh, you know, in your 
in your library. So mm -hmm. just think about it. It might have something. It might, per, you know, have a certain influence. And, mm -hmm. and if so, it would explain some of the things that we are confronted with politically, uh, theologically, with regard to the church, with regard to the government, with regard to our own institutions. Mm -hmm. How do we get along as an institution? How do we get along as a faculty? Mm -hmm. Well, and speaking of <coughs> institution versus individual or individuals or groups within it, one of the big issues in the news lately was the whole Penn State thing, the Jerry yes. Sandusky yes. issue, yes. and of course how that yeah. spilled over into yes. Joe Paterno yes. being fired yes. and all that whole issue. Yes. You know, how does this apply to well, that area of yeah. institution, individuals, responsibility? Yeah. Well, that's another good question. Uh, you're going to be a pretty good questioner, I can see, <laughs> if this program keeps going. <laughs> you're getting on to some of the tough issues. But, well, but I think a lot of people uh, want to address them, and, and now you're yeah, seeing kind of yeah. a sea change. You know, after Joe Paterno's death, yes. you've seen people go from, you know, get him to yeah. uh, now that people are coming out all over saying yeah. he was, it yeah. wasn't his fault. You yeah. know, why'd you do that? Well, I have, I have a perspective on that. I think that the, that the situation uh, uh, we can, uh, of Penn State, we can look at you know, from the perspective of the idea that I just expressed. And we can also add the, the idea that this is something that has to do not only with Joe Paterno, a person, but it has something to do with the way an institution called the university operates. Mm -hmm. The institution of the university is an old classical institution, an institution that has contributed to the development of civilization and to, uh, and to our, our understanding of reality. It's a big, important institution. Now that institution over the, over the centuries has developed its own internal culture. Mm -hmm. Just like those hunter-gatherers, you know, developed a culture and, and developed a way of looking at things and developed a set of answers that they held to. The institution of the, un, of the university has its own internal culture. We're part of that culture. And we know from being in it, if we think about where we are and if we reflect on where we are, we can see that in this institutions, you try to keep things about the institution inside the institution and not let them get out and get in, in, into all kind of other areas for decision like, making. Like any organization, right? You like most to. organizations, but not as, not as long historically as the institution of the university. Mm -hmm. The university has, has its own model for handling issues has its own internal structure for handling issues. It has a lot to do with other institutions as well, but not as historically and as strong as the university. Mm -hmm. What Joe Paterno did, it seems to me, was completely a reflection of that, of that uh, internal culture of the university. Mm -hmm. When something happened, he immediately referred it to the structure of the institution rather than going outside to the police. Because you, you handle things internally, and you don't run out to the to the. Which is what the rule structure of the university said. Here's yes, how you do it. Yes. Now, there's a there, there's another dimension to the Joe Paterno thing that I think needs to be taken into consideration. Not only did he do what ordinarily is done in a university, you try to handle it within the within the institution itself. That also happens within the church. But in Joe Paterno's case, he was, he was faced with an issue that was very difficult for him to understand. A person whom he had respected, one of his coaches, fooling around with a little boy sexually. That, the term for that is pedophilia. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that it not only did Joe Paterno not understand, that's the reason why he asked other people to, to look into it, because he didn't understand it. He didn't understand what was going on. He couldn't evaluate what was going on. So he referred it to it. Now, in psychiatry, only recently 
have they come to try to understand with any success that particular pathology. They recognize it as a pathology now, but I tried to do some research on this and I found psych a psychiatric journals and psychiatric encyclopedias up until the 70s that never even mentioned the term. Mm -hmm. It didn't even appear in the index. Mm -hmm. And then, a re and then after that, in the 70s, it was listed as a paraphilia, which means that it was listed with two other distortions. One was um, uh, uh, when people go around and voyeurism, when they go around trying to look at other people, you know, they should. Mm -hmm. So voyeurism and exhibitionism, when mm -hmm. people go around flashing, you know, and they, and then they put pedophilia in with those three. Now, do you think what is done sexually to small children is on the same Within level the same as somebody class, flashing yeah. some, mm -hmm. you know? No. It shows that even in psychiatry it wasn't properly understood. It wasn't adequately understood. It wasn't understood in any depth. And so to claim that Joe Paterno is... is uh, you know, morally and legally uh, accusable because he didn't understand that is just, it seems to me, ridiculous. Right. And it seems there were so many, you know, like we were talking about before, the tensions coming from different oh, places, yeah. like at the level of the institution yeah. and the level of the team yes. and the level of, you know, the image of Penn State. Absolutely. What's going all on. of those factors, you know, I have to take all those factors into consideration by the guy who's not the, the great philosopher of the institution. He's the coach mm -hmm. of football, you know. But what, what struck me as really interesting was the way that people <clears throat> kind of ganged up against Joe Paterno yeah. after that. You know, yeah. it was the, like the news sources. Of course, the Internet went wild with it, yeah. the social media. Yeah. I got something on Facebook that said, you know, what is the continuum of culpability for Joe Pa? And it had yeah. him... Uh, you know, yeah. photoshopped in and everything, mm -hmm. and it was disturbing to me to yeah. see. And of course, now it's even more disturbing after his yeah, death. death. Yeah. So soon. Well, that I think contributed to his death. There's no doubt about that. That kind of stress and that kind of tension, and that kind of that kind of effect that people have who are disposed first and foremost to blame. Mm -hmm. Some people, when they have a problem, first thing they do is start blaming. Mm -hmm. That's what they did to Joe Paterno. Mm -hmm. And that had a terrible effect on him and contributed to his death. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, the, the, Joe Paterno, uh, uh, as, we, as we mentioned, was also victimized by the institution to which he was uh, associated mm -hmm. because they were under pressure. Mm -hmm. People were saying, you know, why didn't you do something about it, president, board of trustees, all these people? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you do something about it? And they, under that kind of criticism, they fired Joe Paterno. Mm -hmm. In other words, they draw attention to him, put the blame on him. So you have a lot of blaming going on in mm -hmm. this thing. Rather than trying to understand it and understand the complexity, you have people solving it by deciding whom to blame. Mm -hmm. And that's a very crude way of evaluating complex moral problems. But it seems like something that we do all the time, right? I mean, it. the whole guilt cycle, the whole got to find yeah. someone to blame, yeah. got to yeah. find a way to shift it. I mean, it starts for kids. I've seen my yeah. children, you know, yeah. trying to, he yeah. did it, she did it, you yeah. know, kind of thing, and yeah. right on into adulthood, yes. you know, trying to. Yeah, it is. It is. A, a, well, it's a very quick and easy solution to what we described in the other session that we had about the complexity of moral decision. If you're trying to decide what the moral thing to do, in a case like Joe Paterno, you think about all of the issues, all of the involvements, all of the different perspectives, all of the people that are going to be affected by that. All of you have to take all that into consideration, plus the pathology itself and who and how it develops. You know, who can who can manage all of that complexity in a rigorous way? And what's the what's the alternative? blame. Right. And that gave them a quick out. It gave them right? a quick out, sure. Yeah. Sure. But you talk about all these different complexities and yet there was the pressure 
for the Board of Trustees to do something, to yeah. ax someone, to get yeah. rid of them now, to well, act now. That, and, that's understandable because I think because of the, uh, the pervasiveness of this kind of pathology that has emerged in contemporary culture, a lot of it regarding priests, a lot of it regarding school teachers, a lot of it regarding, you know, people like, like uh, the, the, uh, the people at, the, at Penn State. Mm -hmm. um, so that there's been something of a kind of a, a proliferation of, of exposure. Now, how long this has been going on, I think more than likely if we knew that, it was been going on for quite a while. Mm -hmm. But it's been exposed recently. And because it has been exposed, a lot of people are really upset, rightfully. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways in which they ha people in authority have to managing that kind of upset is by assigning blame. Mm -hmm. But with our media, and that's, you know, the exposure has come from the rise of media and the ability to yeah. expose these things. With this rapid action, going on you know, in the 24-hour news cycle, do we now run into you know, problems? You've got these complex moral issues that need yeah. time yes. to look at all the different yeah. avenues and considerations, yeah. and yet yeah. there's this pressure to act yeah. now. Is right. that? Yeah. Well, I think that's, I think that's a good uh, um, perspective on it. That's, that's, that's the case. That's the reason why um, I think that the editorial page in the newspaper is an important part of the newspaper because the newspaper has to cover the issues that, and, the da and the daily developments of the issue. So there's a story about it every day and then the, the, the Board of Trustees does one thing and then the coaches do something else and then there's some people in the, uh, who are contacting their lawyer and they make an, uh, another uh, announcement uh, to the press. And so all of this is in the press, but somebody has to put it together in some perspective, and that's what you have. Reason why you have an editorial page, mm -hmm. and that's the reason why that editorial page is is uh, is important, and that's the reason why personally, you know, I'm concerned. Uh, I write editorial pieces because I think that's an important part of the culture that we have mm -hmm. some resource which is more reflective mm -hmm. and more more uh, generated by some type of of study of the issue mm -hmm. more carefully. Uh, the, I'm a little bit uh, concerned that more and more frequently the editorial page is now half ads. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and that's too bad. Right. Well, I, I think that's that's a serious that's a serious uh, change mm -hmm. and a serious loss in our contemporary culture because if it's all just bits and pieces and snips and then we're going to have blaming, and that's the end. Right. Well, and then we have uh, what's kind of a cacophony of different voices on yes. the opinion page yes. and whatnot. But it should be also, like many of your articles are, a, a place where we can work these things out thoughtfully, actually yes. think about the implications of some of the issues. And that's what you with. do as a professor at the university, mm -hmm. because you're teaching courses that hopefully bring into consideration historical issues and historical ways of understanding things, but also apply it to contemporary issues. Mm -hmm. So your role is to do the very thing that you're saying needs to be done. Put things in perspective, see the complexity, mm -hmm. look at alternative ways of looking at things, try to develop a uh, uh, a defensible position on these issues. Right, and That's hopefully the we university. can. Yeah. yeah, let's slow down. Let's think yeah. about these things. Yes. Let's develop yes. our capacity for critical thinking about. And make sure the university continues to have a place in the society, because if the contemporary politicians have their way, we're going to take all the funding <laughs> out of it's, the university, we're and then we're going to we're going to dumb down the culture to the point of of really being in trouble. Is that a political strategy to dumb down the culture? Well, and, and, that's know, one way it. that's one way it's been handled and it has been handled tragically that way because mm -hmm. if you look at the way great cultures have descended into corruption and ultimately elimination, it comes from a dumbing down. Mm -hmm. And if you have people in the culture who don't understand what's going on, you're in bad shape. Mm -hmm. Do you see with all of the social media and instant messaging and you know phones and so forth do yeah. you th is that 
making us less able to think critically or, or problem solve or think through things? Well, I think it's an issue. Way. I think it's something that has to be attended to. Uh, uh, it's a worry about it. I mean, it's, it's uh, one of the things that we, I'm retired. I'm not meeting with the students every day like you are. But I hear from my colleagues, you know, that more and more students are just focused on that thing in their pocket. Mm -hmm. And even during their class, they have to watch that the students are not texting someone. Mm -hmm. So there is an issue that the technology is generating moral as well as political and social problems. Mm -hmm. Just like we talked about in medicine, the same is true in society. Mm -hmm. There are there are issues of technology in society and how the technology is, is influencing the people, mm -hmm. influencing the citizens, mm -hmm. and questions about whether or not this type of influence is ethical, whether it's productive, whether it's destructive. Those are oh, yeah. classical problems. Yeah. That's the reason why you've got to have philosophy and you've got to have ethics as part of all of the disciplines that you look at. Mm -hmm. Your discipline, medical disciplines, legal disciplines, theological disciplines, they all have to be looking at issues of ethics. Right. And it's not just, in that case, the rapidity that we're spreading things around with the no. media. But like you said, there's really some moral questions about just how they're being used and what's yeah. going on and what's right. going over these right. airwaves. I mean, look, look, look at how many religious developments took place because of the new technologies and somebody, you know, that was able to communicate with through the TV and through the media with thousands of people, and then you have that church developing. And what does that church stand for? Well, the contemporary culture. Right. And for instance, there's you know, talking about religion and the blending religion with the media and the various ways of uh, spreading messages. I mentioned to you that Molotov Mitchell that I ran into the other day, uh, a story about him on NPR and then went and looked him up. And here's this guy who's using a lot of uh, social media and the internet and yeah. uh, producing videos to yeah. uh, spread what appears to me to be hate, you know, yeah. uh, anti-Muslim, anti-gay, yeah. anti-many yeah. different groups. Yeah. Well, those, you, you're bringing up the very kind of questions that we were confronted with in medicine. The new technologies in medicine generated all kind of ethical problems. Right. That's bioethics steps in. Right. Now you have the technology not involved with medicine, but involved with the culture generally, the community, the right. social interaction of persons. It raises all kinds of ethical problems. Yes. Yes, it does. And you know what, Jim? We've got so many different issues that we can <laughs> go into from here. And yeah. I, think, I think what we're going to have to do is bring you back on. For, no. Not tonight. <laughs> not tonight. <laughs> enough is enough, I know, enough I, know, I know you've got to have dinner. Enough. But one of these days, we're going to have to bring you back in because there are many issues we need to talk about. Well, there are plenty of young people around who can handle all these things. <laughs> That's right. And I'm sure they will. Yeah. But thanks for oh, being you're with welcome. us. I'm glad to be here. really a glad pleasure to, be to have you. Yeah. Thanks for helping with this. Show. Thank you. And thank you. Good night.